Larry, you look like Eddie Van Halen. Sorry, a little loud. You have Eddie Van Halen in the studio. Love it. Hey, Casey. What? Turn this part up. This is not what Ryan is listening to. I think this is no, this is our no. theme song, folks. For those about to rockers, we like to say, for those about to talk, here we are yep. in Studio C. Yeah, let me turn that down. Robert doesn't like that music. You know, I, I've but I have a song for you later yeah, on. Wait, yeah, last time was Rocket Man. I'm afraid to no, figure it no, out. No, no, no. Here we are in Studio C and Electric as, Light Orchestra. As promised, we have from the third floor of the old county bank building, occupying no. the El Duce Suite. He looks like Eddie Van Halen, overlooking the old 17th and M Street intersection where all of the commerce used to happen through Merced. <laughs> Houston. Our DA, Larry Morse. Morning, gentlemen. Nice to see you both. Very, very uh, happy that you're in here, Larry. You've been a guest on this show many times. We love and, uh, it. Always enjoyed it. Really like having you come in. And uh, you, you know, know he's the only he's the only guy that actually just talks. You know, everybody else is always trying to couch their politically correct views. And every time I talk to John Pedroso, it's always you know he don't know the story. Well, why don't you tell it to us? Right. Well, Larry's never minced words. We've had him in here before talking about some of the things that he's uh, been doing. Project Ten Percent, this sort of thing. There's been a lot of uh, uh, things in the news lately about a decision that was uh, viewed. People had their minds made up. It seemed already based on just a little bit of evidence. And I'm not talking about Missouri. Uh-oh. I'm talking about Merced, California, and uh, you know we're just going to get right into this uh, about Absolutely. what happened to your son. And I noticed that you had an article in the paper this weekend. Uh, the Merced Sun Star interviewed you, and you know I just like you to share what happened. My my theory is this thing smelled from high heaven right from from the get go. I didn't understand how twenty two equals twenty five and thirty eight, and how this could go along so long. And and you know one thing. You know, I, I have this, this funny uh, sound machine thing here, but one of the things I've always been used to is, and I've mentioned it before, system, the people are represented is law and order. Separate yet equally important there groups, it is. the police who investigate crime and the district attorneys who prosecute the offenders. These are their stories. You know, and, and one law and order, I've always used that comparison with Larry in the past that He's just a, an important cog in the wheel, just as important as the sheriff's office. We always kind of teased internally about who was the top cop in Merced County. And, you know, we've heard of malicious prosecution, but I don't understand this, Larry. What happened? What happened with the process here, the law part of law and order? Well, um, it went off the rails. Um, you know, mistakes happen in our office, mistakes happen in, uh, you know, in public safety uh it's the most incredibly cruel irony of course that it would happen involving the district attorney's uh son but he's no more immune to uh you know the slings and arrows of uh of uh the criminal justice system than anyone else and if there's anything good to take away from this horrific experience it's that uh the system can be uh, fair or unfair to anybody, whether it's a farm laborer's son or the district attorney's son. Uh, I, I share your view that this was a case that never should have been filed. Uh, our office would not have filed uh, with respect to this particular uh, uh, victim. Uh, we had the case briefed to us. Uh, there were, as you re- recall, and you had followed this case, and I know you've referred to it as the Easter Massacre, and we all had followed it very closely. Uh, there were two separate shootings that were somewhat related. The, the two in the backyard, uh, the poor young woman, Samantha, that was murdered in the backyard, and then it spilled out into the street. The we're very comfortable. We're not prosecuting this. The attorney general is taking the whole case on both uh, incidents, the three homicides. Um, we were very comfortable with the state of the evidence with respect to what happened in the backyard. Uh, at the end of being briefed uh, with respect to the, the the murder that for which my son was implicated, we had grave concerns. And before I knew my son had any involvement, uh, was at the party or anything else, uh, we discussed among the chief deputies and uh, Chief Lunny that this is very, very thin. The problem is this 
in this individual, uh, Mr. Tellez, uh, Jacob Tellez, mm-hmm. was arrested a year and a half earlier, uh, shortly after the, the homicide, mm-hmm. on the basis of what is commonly called a butt dial, but a 911 tape where he pocket dialed uh, his, his phone and 911 picked it up. Right. And after listening, after that was forwarded to the sheriff's department, mm-hmm. uh, the, the previous lead detective on that case, who's no longer with the sheriff's department, has gone to another agency, he went and got an arrest warrant for Jacob Tellez. And they brought Jacob Tellez in. Uh, and he was interviewed and he was asked, he waved and agreed to talk to the officers. And he said, yes, I was in a car. Yes, I did have a gun. I had brought a gun for protection. Um, And when the shooting started out on the street, after what had gone on in the backyard, yes, I did try to pull this gun out of my waistband. But I got it hooked up in the seatbelt, and Mm -hmm. the kid next to him, who was was the guy who had actually brought him to uh, our house, was a childhood friend of his, and he grabbed his arm and said, don't do this, don't do this, you've got a child on the way. Apparently, uh, Tellos had a baby on the way. So he didn't, and they left. After interviewing Jacob Tellos, the lead detective on the case, went back and listened to the tape again. Mm -hmm. And at the end of that, he concluded, and it's in the police report, that he was telling the truth, that it made sense, that his explanation absolutely made sense with the the 911 tape. and And... not only did they not charge Tellus, the right. detective went to the judge and asked that the warrant that had been issued for his arrest be recalled. Right, and I understand that that tape, there's no confession on that tape. There's no confession on this tape. It was one of the things my son said repeatedly, Dad, this doesn't say what they think it says. Right. In any event, so between that time when, when Jacob Tellus was released and 16 months later, nothing new had come in. There was not a single additional piece of evidence with respect to Jacob Tellus, not one. All that happened was that somebody else in the sheriff's department listened to the tape and drew a different conclusion and thought that the tape, in fact, implicated Tellus, right? Right. So, and one of the detectives who testified during the prelim admitted on the stand during the prelim that, yes, even though that was his opinion that it indicated that Tellers was involved, that was not the consensus opinion in the sheriff's department, that there was div- division among the deputies or the detectives mm-hmm. as to what exactly that tape said. Right. So you don't even have a consensus among the detectives as to whether this tape is uh, exculpatory mm-hmm. or inculpatory. It points to his guilt. Right. And that's the same evidence that for which Tellers was arrested originally, and ultimately released, and then 16 months later is arrested. I fault the Attorney General's office hugely for this mess because law enforcement agencies, this whole thing we kid about is who's the chief law enforcement officer. I'm not the top cop because I'm not a cop. I am the district attorney is the chief law enforcement officer of the county, whether it's the sheriff's department or Atwater PD Mm -hmm. or Livingston or UC Merced, they all bring their cases to our department, to the attorney or to the district attorney's office. We then read the reports, evaluate the evidence and decide what, if any charges are going to be filed. We're the final arbiter of whether a case should be filed. In this case, we, we discover when I learned that the, uh, that the uh, sheriff's, had concerns about my son's involvement in this case. Not we didn't believe that they thought of him as a suspect, but right. that they didn't they weren't they didn't believe that he was telling the truth about what had happened. Right. We immediately made a decision. We've got to get out of this case. We've got a conflict. Let's get that. Let's get out of this. Right. So I uh, instructed our chief deputies to contact the attorney general's office. The attorney general's office came up on a Wednesday and picked up the file. They filed against Tellas the following day. Now. I've been doing this for 20 some years. There is no way in the world that you could make an informed filing decision on a case that's 16 months old, that 300 plus page police report, all kinds of interviews, and in which uh, the suspect has already been arrested and released on essentially the same evidence. Mm -hmm. You cannot have made an informed filing decision, in my opinion, in that kind of time. You didn't have enough time 
we all agreed you didn't have enough time to go through the police report in 24 hours. And there was nothing new, correct? There it was wasn't like there was some in uh, another uh, witness, another informant, something came new. Nothing. This had sat new. in cold for months because that's what we talked about on this show was the frustration that nothing, you know, there didn't seem to be any leads and what the sheriff was doing. And it begs the question, do you think the sheriff was looking for, for something, anything, grasping at straws by sending this up to the state? No, uh, we, I think they genuinely believed that they, that Tellez was the right guy. I think there was a division within the, de the detectives because mm. clearly the guy who had it originally cut him loose right. without even following up because they could have discovered right after the shooting had happened who was driving the car. It was my son. It was right. our, my family car. Right. Who else was in the car? They didn't follow up on any of that. The, the detective who had the case at that time was confident enough that Tellez wasn't the guy that they didn't even try to find out, well, who were the other kids in this car? What kind of car was it? Let's right. interview them. They they got statements from no one else. Right. And, so, and, and then it laid fallow and, for 16 months. And, and speaking of statements, Ethan felt the need during this time after Tellez was, I guess, looked at again. I'm not quite sure the timeline, but he wanted to go forward with some information. I'm sure you were probably, hey, wait a minute. Uh, uh, but very proud of him at the same time wanting to clear this tell us his name. Well, you know, contrary to all the the noise that has been disseminated on this case, you know, both in, in newspapers and, you know, blogs and everything else, I'll tell you exactly how it went down. And I'm not going <clears> to <throat> pull any punches on this. Uh, my son had not been truthful with me a year and a half earlier because after the shooting, I'd asked him. I knew this was a kid's party, and I said... Hey, you weren't at that party. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, and it had come up a couple of times and said, you weren't at that party. And, I, and he said, no. And I'm like, okay, all right. And so uh, we talked about it over the, over the year, and uh, he knew he would have been in trouble for going and all that sort of stuff. So, uh, you know, he candidly did not level with me about having gone to that party. Didn't want a butt whooping. <laughs> he would have been in, in deep guano for that, and he knew that. And, you know, I'm, I mean, that's just the way it is. I can't sugarcoat that. He did not level with me about this. So uh, fast forward a year to July, we get the briefing from the detectives that they've cleared this case, right? And as I said, the one in the backyard seemed like there were a lot of eyewitnesses, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. The one out in front for which Ethan was implicated seemed kind of thin. Mm -hmm. They all were already heading to a press conference. We hadn't reviewed it, which is also something that we're not terribly comfortable with on an old case, a cold case. Boy, you ought to bring it over and run it by us and make sure we're all on the same page that we believe there's enough to go forward, not schedule a press conference and then brief us, you know, a half hour before you're going to go and announce this. Right. That just... You know, I, I will hasten to point out that in the eight years that I've been the district attorney, we have lost one homicide case. We've won close to 40 murder cases, and we've lost one, and not since 2007, in part because we rigorously evaluate the evidence and often have to tell MPD, the SO, whatever law enforcement agency it is, we're kind of thin here, guys. Right. We need more. Right. And, you know, sometimes cops are unhappy about that. Well, sure. it's, it's a natural tension that exists. Right. And but, so are victims. They, they, yeah. Everybody wants their case prosecuted. Exactly. And I've heard, oh, you know, he didn't look at this. He didn't look at that. Folks, you have to have it beyond a reasonable doubt, That's not a reasonable suspicion. The difference between having probable cause to make an arrest and beyond a reasonable doubt in a jury is yes. a, it can be a very wide divide. And we have to make sure that we have the evidence to prove our case beyond a reasonable doubt. So in any event, that night, I go home, I'm sitting on the couch, my, my son is three weeks away from going off to Arkansas on a wrestling scholarship that he's earned. Uh, we're sitting down, my wife and I, that evening. I tell him, hey, they cleared that Atwater case. We talk about cases occasionally. And I said, they arrested some kid named Jacob Tellis. And he's standing in the kitchen and he looks and he goes, they've got the wrong guy, Dad. And I said, what do you mean they got the wrong guy? He goes, he didn't do it. And I said, how do you know he didn't do it? And he said, I was there. And you know, What did your heart do at uh, that point? Just hit the floor. My wife and I, you know, what, what do you mean you were there? So <laughs> for the next hour, we're like, well, what exactly happened? And da-da-da-da. Yeah, we, can you imagine him being grilled by two attorneys? Oh, yeah. no, no. <laughs> and he's raised in a family of lawyers. He's not, you know, when we pinned him down, he admitted, no, I know, I didn't tell you that. I didn't want to be in trouble for going to the party. Nothing happened in our car. We didn't. I didn't see anything, so he wasn't a witness right. to a shooting. It wasn't like he sat out. He just knew when we told him that Tellus had been arrested that Tellus hadn't done it. 
So I said, well, pal, we can't let a guy sit in the bucket for something that he didn't do. I know this guy's not a choir boy, but we can't have anybody in custody for anything they didn't do. He goes, I know. I'll go and talk to the detectives. So that night, I texted one of the detectives and said, we got a problem with the Tellez case. The next day I called. I explained what was going on. My son said he's available and he'll be there whenever they want him. They couldn't see him until Sunday night. Mm -hmm. So Sunday night... I drove over. He followed me over to the sheriff's uh, detectives unit. I sent him in. He had no problem without a lawyer. There's five in my family. I certainly, if I was thinking that there was exposure on his part, would have sent somebody in. But he went in by himself and sat down and talked to the detectives. And that took a lot of guts. And we have to go to our first break, and we're going to pick this up after the break. But there was no reason for you to think that something that he was going to be arrested. None. You knew what he said. He had come clean with you. Let's pick this up after the break. I want to, you know, you mentioned uh, you, you mentioned Arkansas, and I know that's uh, uh, I think your your uh, alma mater, isn't it? It is. He's a Razorback. So anyway, we're just going to go out. I don't know if Larry will remember this yes. song. Yes. But we'll be right back on Arkansas Citizen Watch. Fight. We appreciate everybody Very listening. Good. Stay tuned. Stay tuned, folks. You're not going to want to miss this show. We'll be right back on Citizen Watch. Well, folks, here we are back on Citizen Watch, the second segment on KYOS. A beautiful Saturday morning. We appreciate you joining us. We have in studio, as promised, Larry Morse, district attorney for the county of Merced. Just came off a successful election victory where he was unopposed in June, didn't have to go to the runoff. I don't know if Steve Gomes bought you lunch or not, but uh, it's my understanding whoever got the most votes owed the other one lunch. Did uh... I'm waiting for that lunch. <laughs> <laughs> You're waiting for that lunch. Folks, before we went to the break, Larry was talking about how Ethan was drawn into this situation. Larry didn't know the full facts until a year and a half later when Mr. Tellez was picked up and Ethan confided in his dad, which I'm sure was hard to be honest with your dad sometimes about what's going on. And he said, look, you got to do the right thing. You got to go down there. You got to get this guy out of the bucket. Tell what you know. And that's where we left off. He went to the sheriff's department. He talked to him without representation. Then what happened? Well, and I would hasten to add, you know, uh, that I didn't have to convince Ethan to do this. He voluntarily said, I will go and talk to the detective. That's right. He came to you. Well, he just said, I know, dad. I know I have to talk to him. And Jacob Tellez was not, contrary to what's been reported, a close friend of Ethan's at all. He knew him very casually. He had been brought over to our house that night uh, by a mutual friend. Mm-hmm. And Ethan knew Tellez only slightly, uh, you know, and so they weren't like running buddies. Right. Tellez uh, had a gang history. Right. Uh, the, the unforgivably stupid thing that my son did was that he knew that Jacob Tellez had a gun when mm-hmm. he came over to the house, a twenty two caliber. Right. And he... Uh, allowed him to get in the car with seven other kids in the car. And I asked him, I said, what in God's name were you thinking, dude? Are you kidding me? And his, and his statement to me was dad, I didn't want to be a wuss. Peer pressure. Yeah, basically. And this is a kid who's an all, you know, conference, all league wrestler, but he said, I didn't want to be a wuss and say, you can't get in the car if you have a gun. And if I if he had left the gun at the house, he would have come back to the house, and I wasn't I didn't want him to spend the night at the house. So I'm like, well, that's maybe the stupidest thing you'll mm-hmm. ever do in your life. Yeah, you're you know, and obviously paid a horrific price for that bad decision. It was a 16 year old dummy decision, but mm-hmm. I you know he leveled with me about why he made it, and there's no you know getting around that that was a poor decision with horrific consequences. That's right. In any event. Ethan then contacted, arranged with the detectives, he contacted the other people who were in the car, and he had them come forward, Mm -hmm. right, and arrange for them to come in. Um, On Friday, on Thursday, like I said, Tellez was arrested, and Friday morning, my wife actually had called me that morning and said, you don't think Ethan's in trouble? And I'm like, no way, you know, he didn't do anything. Three o'clock that afternoon, they come with an arrest warrant at my house and arrested Ethan in the front yard. and I was told that he was arrested as an accessory, uh, aider and a better to first-degree murder. No mm-hmm. bail, uh, no thing. 
And just because he was the driver, we may explain to people the California felony murder rule. If you're in the car, somebody else pulls the trigger, you're just as guilty. If you know that a crime is going to occur, you right. have to have knowledge and, and take some active role in the crime. That makes you an aider and a better. That's the law of aider and a better. It's not the felony murder rule. It's aider and a better law. Okay. That if you are aware that a crime is going to be uh, uh, completed and you take an, uh, some participatory role in it, mm -hmm. not just not doing anything, that's not enough, but... As the, as the case of, well, let me just skip forward. So Ethan's arrested. His mother and I are in total, you know, shock and, mm -hmm. and horrified. And we know what's happened, but, you know, this is our son. So we, you know, understand that most people's reaction is going to be, well, parents are always going to stand by their kids and, you know, as they should. And, um, but we knew what had happened and what he, what he told us. One of the things he kept saying is, Dad, do you not think I would know if a gun was fired inside a car two feet behind my head? Mm -hmm. It's a very, even a small caliber gun is going to be extremely loud in a car with all the windows rolled up except the one. Right. That was never really pursued with any of the witnesses or anything in the car. Um, a week and a half after Ethan is arrested, uh, my youngest son was in Germany with a friend of his. Uh, gone to visit family there and of course he was totally stressed after hearing what happened the news had gotten to him very quickly and so he wanted to come home and we were like no you it's probably best for you to be there right now mm -hmm. anyway he contacts my wife and says he has been contacted by a friend of his my my youngest whose mom wants to talk to my wife so my wife is thinking, oh, okay, it's somebody else who people were very kind to us in many ways and wanted to say how sorry they were and all that. But this woman comes to see Cindy and tells her that her two oldest kids were at the party, that it wasn't Ethan and it wasn't Jacob Tellis, that that wasn't what happened, that her son saw the murders in the backyard and that he was out in the front yard and watched exactly how this murder unfolded and that there were a couple of Merced gangsters uh, from a well-known criminal street gang in Merced, mm -hmm. one of whom had shot the victim uh, and hit him with a, uh, in the head, in the neck, mm -hmm. with a gun, and the other guy who had come up and finished shot him while he was on his knees. This was the stippling we heard about behind the ear. Well, this was another problem, of course, with the case against my son is we, you know, I essentially had to hire an attorney, Kirk McAllister from uh, Modesto, to do the investigation that hadn't been done. Right. Because one of the things that was never uh, explained was how do you get stippling, which is from a close-range gunshot, uh, on a drive-by shooting? Yeah. And I've seen the photographs. Uh, there is all kinds of gunpowder marks uh, around the wound mm -hmm. in the in the right behind the ear of the victim uh, in this case. Uh, that is a close range fire. Uh, you know, me. firearms. It's uh, you know somewhere from six inches to maybe five so, or six feet. So excuse me, Larry. So this is more like an assassination. Well, it's a as uh, one of the witnesses on the uh, one of the pathologists said, is this. Would this be consistent with a coup de gras shot? Right. And he said yes. Didn't say that's what it was, but it'd be consistent with that. So the other thing that has never been explained, never even a theory offered, right. is how do you explain who fired the other four thirty eight or three fifty seven, they're not sure which caliber they are, right. shots that killed the victim in this case. There were two separate guns. Now 16 months later, they come and serve a search warrant at my house right. and, and actually go, uh, I tell them my gun, I have a 38 and it had been at my office. So I said, I haven't had my gun here forever. It's been two years or so and it's been my office. So they went and seized my gun thinking that maybe it's going to be the magic weapon that has right. the, and of course it wasn't. It was you know, very quickly determined uh, not to be connected to this at all. So you have gunshot you know, you have stippling that is inconsistent with a drive-by shooting. You have no explanation for how a second gun is involved in this. Right. Uh, they didn't do what's called GSR gunshot residue testing on the victim in this case. They had bagged his hands in preparation for doing GSR, but it had never been done until our attorney said, you're kidding me, this hasn't been done. 
and he asked, demanded that GSR be done on the victim. Uh, it was done by the Department of Justice, and it came back with gunshot residue on both hands, mm. all right, which suggests that he was firing a gun as well. Now, there was another person that was shot that night, a Merced uh, gang member, well-known, well-known gang member that was shot in the stomach, who was with Samantha, was friends with Samantha. Uh, he was shot in the stomach, very uncooperative in this whole whole thing. There was never any gunshot residue test done on him whatsoever. He's still cruising around with that bullet in him. So the woman who told us about the her son having seen this, yeah, she had no knowledge when she's telling my wife this that there were two guns involved in this in this uh, victim's death, right. She had no knowledge that hadn't been out in the papers, but that was consistent with what the evidence showed. Her story, two son, shooters. Two shooters. And so this woman, I, I know there's been talk about, we actually know maybe who the murders are or point that direction. Has the sheriff department pursuing that? Is anybody investigating who maybe really did this crime? I have no idea. We're out of the case. Uh, obviously, this is something that you'd have to ask with the, with the sheriff's department. Now, I'd just tell you that you know, I've been prosecutor for a long time. I've done probably as many or more homicide prosecutions, trials than anybody in this county. Um, you know, I have never seen a case, a murder case, that was not held to answer at the prelim. What, uh, when you go to a prelim, you have to show that a crime was committed mm -hmm. and that the person or persons charged more likely than not right. were responsible. And that threshold isn't really high, is it, Larry? It's, it's not like a trial. Well, in 25 years, I've never seen a homicide case where the person was not held to answer at, at the preliminary hearing. Except? More than until this. And, and more than that, that the judge actually issued a factual finding of innocence. Yeah, let's talk about that, because people are giving you a lot of heat. Like, well, you know, special treatment, but no. Yeah, Anybody, yeah I, I was lost on this part. Yeah, and Larry's <clears> going to explain it. Well, what the judge, and let me just back up for one second, you know, among the, the, the stories that are, you know, out there about, sure. uh, you know, I've heard people telling me that I golf every week with right. uh, Judge Hanson. I have only the most passing personal relationship with Judge Hanson. I, I've known him because we're all in the same legal community. I've never spent any time on a personal level beyond sitting around in a group at a cocktail party at the right. annual bar dinner with Judge Hanson. And anyone who knows Judge Hanson knows that he is beyond reproach. Ethically, uh, his integrity is unassailable. Right. And the suggestion that this is corrupt or good old boy stuff is just the the you know blitherings of people who don't want to understand how the system works yes. and there's nothing you can say that's going to change their mind they're entitled to their opinion but it is it is ignorant and it is uninformed and just uh does that bother you though larry well real quickly because what what i have heard is exactly that well, you know, uh, he's a judge. Larry's the DA. You know, they try cases together. They know each other. They're all in the bar together. They're all in cahoots. And I don't think that's true. I, I know that's the, you know, uh, an easy, simplistic narrative, but it just ignores the, the reality of how the criminal justice system works. Judge Hansen isn't going to put his career, his reputation, his 40, 50 years as a lawyer and a judge on you know on the line for me or for anyone else no. i knew when he uh, when he said he'd keep the case i frankly you know thought well all the judges will disqualify themselves when he took it it didn't surprise me because he's a guy who always has marched to his own tune he doesn't care what anybody thinks but doesn't that also make your point which is look there's a bunch of judges on the bench okay i know donnie proetti I, sure. don proetti and them and if they've got a relationship with you they're going to back out of it right but if like you had said judge hansen only had a cursory hey how you doing larry he wouldn't uh excuse himself would he there isn't any judge i've ever met that's going to tank a case for anybody and there certainly isn't anybody on the merced bench and ron hansen as i said anybody in the legal community would tell you is an absolute square shooter, lifelong resident of Merced, and he called it as he saw it. And if he felt like there was enough to hold Ethan, I would have said, okay, I'm going to have to live with this because it isn't going to get any fairer from anybody else. But instead what he found is there was evidence that Ethan didn't do it. He made a specific factual finding of innocence in saying that 
there was no gun fired from the car. And if there was no gun fired from the car, Ethan and Jacob Tellez are out <clears throat> of complicity in the murder. Now, Tellez has other charges that are still pending. Ethan was completely exonerated up or down on whether there was a gunshot fired from the car. And Judge Hansen, after listening to that 911 tape, right. he concluded, contrary to what the Sheriff's Department had later concluded after originally, you know, saying that it was exculpatory. Right. Judge Hansen listened to it and said, no, this testimony or this tape is consistent with the testimony of the kid who was sitting next to Tellez right. and grabbed his arm and said, don't do it. And it was consistent with what Tellez had said. Mm -hmm. Moreover, when Judge Hansen in chambers, uh, well, I, I can't talk. And some of this is still off, sure, off the record. Yeah. But uh, there was evidence uh, of another, of the shooting that we talked about being, mm -hmm. uh, you know, being someone else. So I can't, change what people are going to think people like conspiracy theories people like to assume the worst about uh the system and about the people in the system and that you know, is their right as citizens this is what i always say they always throw rocks at the lead dog uh, you're the lead dog oh, yeah. in this county and you're going to be the subject of criticism you have a thick <laughs> skin yep. you're not like some of our leaders who can't take any criticism okay. you've been in the hot seat before this isn't your first rodeo so I would like them. We had other issues yep. in the past, and you've addressed them. You've dealt with them. You haven't shirked away from them. And look what we have on the national scene. People that don't like a decision, that do everything they can to turn it and spin it and try to get a, re to try to get a result that's just not there. Folks, we're at the end of our second break. We're going to be back. I told you I'd have some music that Robert likes. Oh, God. This is, oh, man. <laughs> This is his. You're such an Captain It's Neil, an old boss from the past. But <laughs> Muskrat. Look, love we have Larry Morse, at Morse least, in studio. At least have it by America. We have one segment left, folks, and we ask that you join us with this. We'll be back right after <laughs> this. Stay tuned. Float like the heavens above. Looks like Muskrat Hey, you know whose theme song this used to be when he was on Fuck these airwaves? Our former sheriff, Mark Payson. Hey, do you find it interesting that Mark's in charge of natural disasters for the state? <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, You're I'm, going there? I'm going to uh, let that comment pass. But, you know, I will say something on that front. I you are going to let it pass. No. I, well, I, I'll let some of it pass. But actually, because ironically, my son was a victim of what hadn't been done in, in the sheriff's department. Uh, you know that I complained bitterly for a lot of years about the fact that the sheriff's department had no gang operation. You not only complained bitterly, but you went spoke before the board of supervisors and yes. you ruffled some feathers. I did. And, and I'm wondering, does this have something to do with that? No, 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 I don't. I never, I had people come up to me throughout this thing and say, was this the sheriff's department out to get you? And I'm like, absolutely not. I have had a great working relationship with the sheriff's department. The members of that department are some of the finest people in law enforcement. I have great admiration for them. This was a, a failure, a mistake, uh, an enormous error uh, that, you know, hopefully will be investigated and but they'll it, try and unravel this. But here's, here was my point. When this when this shooting happened, we all know this was a gang related shooting, right? Yes. No question about it. You had Merced gangsters. Right before the sh shots rang out, there was a car driving up in in front of the house that was opening the door and yelling out "A Town," which mm -hmm. is an Atwater gang. Because the sheriff's department at that time, I will give them credit. In the last year, they really stepped up since Mark quit. They mm -hmm. stepped up uh, the gang, you know, involvement by the sheriff's department considerably. Right. But at that time, they had no gang officers, no gang experts, no gang capacity whatsoever. No, I thought they had one person assigned to the Ass whole county. Assigned to the gang task force. Okay. But they didn't reach out, even though there was A-Town involvement. Right. They didn't reach out to Atwater, which has a top flight gang operation. Right. Even though there were Merced gangsters involved in this, well-known gangsters, they did not reach out to the Merced Gang Violence Suppression Unit. Mm -hmm. And they didn't contact and bring in for assistance the Merced County Gang Task Force. Right. So all of these leads that should have been followed up on and which would have hastened, hopefully, the investigation were just left. 
and so you know you get a bad premise you get bad results right uh and that's what really happened here is that this was a gang case and the result of not having had any gang involvement for 10 previous years right came home to roost and Scares I- me. ironically and this is not like we're in Marin County. No. This is Merced, which has a serious, serious gang problem. And we've talked about that before. You know, uh, we had an election for new sheriff here just recently. Vern Warnke and Pat Lenny, mm-hmm. who's the lead investigator at your office, ran. Vern Warnke was successful. When I interviewed him on these airways, he had the following to say, and I want your opinion on this. Sure. Let's talk about the liaison between the DA's office and the sheriff's office. Previous administration, you could have started a fire with the friction between those two. How are we going to work together with the DA? Because they prosecute. There's always that who's the top cop. But right. let's, let's not have a, a contest here. Yeah, this isn't what do a we sword have to fight. Do? This isn't a sword fight. we got to get beyond that and, and take it for what it is. Um, I feel like I can work with about anybody. And uh, if I'm fortunate enough to be elected, I know that I can work with our DA no matter who that is. And right now it's currently Larry Morris. I know right. that I can work with that man. Uh, I'm very good at um, dealing with folks. Mm-hmm. And that's what you got to do. And you're, there can be a personal relationship there, but it can also be professional. Right. Uh, I'm the kind of guy that we can come in and we can take care of it. Will Larry and I go out and break bread together? No, eh, probably not. But we can. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's going to be an issue there. You know, there's concerns about Larry supporting Pat in this, and I'm wondering, right. and you know what, if I get fortunate enough to win this election, how's Larry going to feel about that? Well, you know what, I'd like to think Larry's professional enough that no matter who the sheriff is, if they can develop a good professional relationship, then good things can happen. Well, I've, I've interviewed Mr. Morris on these railways many times, and I think the same thing. I think he is professional, and he can do that. So, Larry, that was uh, Vern. He is now the sheriff, and you're going to have to work with him. I look forward to working with Vernon. And vice versa, he's going to have to work with you. But Absolutely. boy, this sure kind of yes. sets things. Now, you had mentioned in the paper about an investigation. If this malfeasance, if this misdirection had happened in your office, you'd be looking internally. Do you think the sheriff should be looking internally, the new sheriff elect? Well, I'm not going to tell Vern uh, how to run his, uh, his department. That's uh, his call. Uh, I can say that when you step back and you look at the fact that in. 25 years, no one in the legal community can remember a case in which a homicide did not get past a prelim. That suggests that there were some serious problems. And the only explanation is that somehow uh, there were failures on the part of the investigation or the judge made a mistake. And I don't believe anyone is going to come out and suggest that, you know, Judge Hansen made a mistake. They haven't said that. So that only leaves one other a uh, plausible scenario, and if that is in fact the case, then there ought to be some, you know, in, in my view, uh, you know, there ought to be some further inquiry to see what happened. Um, the system is predicated on faith in its, in its fairness and in its accuracy. The worst thing that I can possibly do as a prosecutor is have someone in custody for one minute that they, for something they didn't do. It keeps all of us up at night. There are people in this community that we believe probably have committed homicides and serious crimes, but we do not have enough evidence right. to put them in, in prison or jail. That's the way the system works, and we have to respect that. Having said that, I have never, you know, Vern and I have had a cordial relationship. I have no animosity uh, towards Vern whatsoever. Uh, I supported Pat, but so did every police chief in Merced County, the right. chief probation officer. Uh, we all thought the world of Pat, uh, you know, and think he would have done a terrific job. The voters uh, selected Vern Warnke. I certainly respect that. I have the highest regard for Vern's integrity mm-hmm. uh, and his character. Uh, one of the things that gives me great uh, encouragement is his uh, expressed preference to hire uh, Sue Norris. Yes, as a under sheriff. Sue worked. Uh, uh, Sergeant Norris, I worked with her on many homicide cases mm-hmm. uh, as a detective when she was a detective, and she worked in my office for several years when she left the sheriff's department. Sue is uh, a woman of rare gifts and would be a tremendous uh, asset uh, to Vern, and so that gives me great confidence that he's got uh, the right idea about what needs to go forward in the department. I have enough challenges running my own department. Yes. I'm not passing along any uh, advice uh, to Vern Warnke. He's going to find his own challenges in there. And, and we God, know there are many. Yeah, and God bless him. And uh, 
uh, all of us in the law enforcement community are invested in the sheriff being successful. So I will help Vern. I sent him a letter immediately after the election congratulating him and pledging my support to him uh, in any way that I could, and I will continue to uh, help in any way that I can. Go ahead, Robert. Oh, I think that's great, but I'm, I'm, I'm concerned. You know, years ago I had a problem in Modesto, and the police department never investigated. And I noticed a pattern with some police op- police departments where they don't investigate fully. They feel that they've got something. They throw it in the district attorney and say, tell it to the judge. And, and this sounds like exactly that. And what concerns me is your name is Larry Morse. As far as I'm concerned, you, you, you are the top law enforcement official. You know these laws. You know these rules. There's a lot of things that you have said that I went, scratched my head and went, what? Here I am, just a regular citizen. And can you imagine, Casey, you or I are a regular citizen in this situation? No. We were Ethan Morse. We no. don't have five we don't have five family members that are attorneys, okay, that can say, Hey, can you imagine how many people might have a problem like they're having in Ferguson? Right. I can see why people are concerned with law. Here, we're gonna just do this schlock operation, we're gonna throw it over here, and all of a sudden you're in front of a judge. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's scary. And uh, you know, I <laughs> It, I mean, I'm sorry for you, Larry. It I, had to I really, be surreal. It, truly it had was. to be surreal for the Morse family, all of them, to be faced with this situation. My response in July was shock, and I didn't understand it. And Larry and I didn't have a chance to talk until this interview. And again, I appreciate him coming in and talking about this, but literally a nightmare. And that's why we kind of wanted to deconstruct this, right? find sure. out what's happening now, because the bottom line, there's still three people that are dead. Yes. We understand and, that. And but we need to find who did this. Right. We do. And, and it's going to be tough to do. But the thing that I appreciate with Larry is, is his straightforward and candidness. You know, I, I listen to baseball, and there's these conspiracy theorists. And the reason that there's conspiracy theorists is because it gives them closure or some kind of, you know, who killed Kennedy? Right, well, right. There, there's a conspiracy we can hang our hat on because they don't understand, like Larry had said, the process. Right. I'm sitting here in, in, in stunning because I thought, I'm going to be very honest. You know, it come out, got to be. Poor Ethan, you know, wow. And then you hear Larry talking, you're like, well, wait a minute. Right. 22, 25, 38? No, it Jeez. doesn't add up. I, I'm not a mathematical whiz, but I can tell you those <laughs> numbers don't add up. Look, we're getting close to time. I want to talk a little bit about Larry. Some of the other things he's doing, the good things he's doing over there at the district attorney office, one of them, we've talked about before, Project 10%. Uh, we continue to move forward on Project 10%, which uh, you've been very, uh, very kind and gracious in helping us promote. It's a, 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 pro, a program in which uh, UC Merced students go into junior highs and talk to these junior high kids mm-hmm. about how they rose above the challenges in their lives to get into the top college in the United or in California, the UC system. Right. Uh, we just had some money. One a local attorney, Carlos Fuentes, just donated. Uh, some money and we got a car to help because one of the biggest things was getting the kids transportation to the schools in Merced County so that they can meet with these kids but they've already in two years seen roughly 8,000 eighth grade students so we it's all about credibility you know if I go in and talk to uh, eighth graders they look at me as an old boring white guy Uh, you have some interesting stories yeah I have interesting stories (laughs) but I'm an old boring white guy to a 13 or 14 year old when a UC Merced student who may be uh, Hispanic or uh, African American or East Indian goes in or Asian and goes in and sits down and says hey I grew up in the Central Valley I had gangs at you know at my school my parents were immigrants or farm workers or whatever and this is the, this is what I did these are the choices I made and if I can do this I promise you, you can do this because I'm just like you. And they they look like a, their big brother, big sister, or a young right. aunt or uncle. And, and that, you can just see the How come we don't have that? Well, that's what we're doing. That's what Project 10% that's is about. Project and that's why we're trying to connect with these kids on a level. Because like Larry will tell you, this is something you're not going to receive results tomorrow. No. You're not going to receive results by Christmas. You're talking years. And if we don't start early, yeah. you're not going to see those results at 15, 16, 17 years old when we're finding young lives being thrown away. I know I'm moving along quickly. I appreciate you coming in and talking about this very very personal situation yes. but let's talk a little bit you've been a big uh, advocate of downtown because you live downtown yes we have the homeless issue we just had the cleanup along bear creek i'm all for it 
What do you think the answer is from a DA standpoint? How do you, you know, we don't have room at the end. We can't give them tickets, have the revolving door system. What do you think needs to happen? I don't want to step outside your field of expertise here. but No, I, I'm usually talking as a downtown resident, Robert, and I are neighbors. Um, one of the things that's always frustrated me in 20 years of living downtown is that in most areas, most cities that have their act together, the downtown area is a, a desirable location. Mm-hmm. In Merced, you have some of the most beautiful homes uh, that could possibly be built. Craftsman, Berkeley, Bungalow, Victorian homes. They're right. just gorgeous on large lots, which yes. is not the trend these days. No, it isn't. The city has never made it a priority to create a, a desirable downtown residential area. And if you don't have a downtown residential area where people feel safe, and a lot of people, my kids always say, we live in the hood, Dad. I'm like, no, we don't. We live in a great neighborhood. Da, da, da. very nice. But they, that's the perception. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have a good residential area, the downtown business district, people aren't going to come down. And mm-hmm. you, we all know folks who will not come down to restaurants or whatever downtown because they don't want to be panhandled they don't feel safe that's oh, crazy it is but you have it's got to be a priority what larry doesn't tell you really quickly is if you go to down 21st street you've got all these greek revival homes right from the turn of the century mm-hmm. four bedroom whatever well what they have done a mm-hmm. lot of realtors go in there they've scarfed them up and then they've piecemealed them out you're like what four families live in that yeah. house and so what you have is you have trans transit you know Transient going back occupancy yeah you don't have anybody that's state and one of the things i've always thought that they should do is they need to start leaning on absentee landlords right if the police are coming to your place you own an apartment complex and mm-hmm. the police are coming there you know more than two or three times in a year the landlord ought to get the bill that's right nuisance public nuisance yeah, absolutely and what do we what do we do about some of the residents that in you know their animal confinement rights and they they insist on having geese i mean is this a problem with downtown <laughs> well, i happen to see birds that should be flying Flying free above uh, the skies. <laughs> Larry watched me chasing them down the street and the just laughed. Yes. Well, yes. let me tell you, those things are getting big, and Thanksgiving is coming up. So yes. let's not. Uh, yes. You know, Larry, this this hour has gone by uh, very very quick. Excuse me, that was the wrong song. This hour has gone by very very quick, and I appreciate you again coming in and and spending some time with us here on Citizen Watch. My thoughts go out to you and Cindy Thank as they you. did back in July. I'm glad this was successfully resolved. For those rock throwers out there in the community, listen to the evidence. Don't succumb to what's happening on the national scene right here in our own once little nice town of Merced. Listen to the facts. Don't, don't be clouded by innuendo. Don't be clouded by your personal bias. The system worked this time. And it's the way it was supposed to work. And Ethan needs to be given credit for coming forward and doing the right thing in face of diversity. If it would have been my kid, I said, you're not going to go anywhere. A lot of parents did. There are a lot of kids that were at this party that know what happened who have never come forward. And that is one of the concerns is if the police think these kids are going to come forward and cooperate in the future, many of them have already said to us, we've seen what happened when Ethan tried to come (laughs) forward and do the right thing. Yeah, We're not stepping forward. Yeah, kind of like old Frank trying to get someone to drive that PAL van in Atwater. Nobody's really grabbing those keys. But again, Larry, thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. We're going out with the alma mater. and Thank you. Thank you.